Chapter 66, The Parents. The juggernaut was sinking, that massive floating vessel, that mighty industrial structure was slowly being swallowed by the sea. As water flooded the station, fires were washed out and steam hissed into the air. The main platform disappeared beneath the waves and then only the buildings and towers still stood above the surface. Soon they'd also disappear and the entire station would be lost. On the roof of the control tower below the twinkling stars, Roz was speaking with the geese. She explained that a fleet of cleanup robots was coming to stop the poison tide and remove it from the ocean. At least that's what the humans had promised. For now, though, the deep sea mining robot kept working and the poison tide kept flowing. The humans told me to go home, said Roz, but I cannot let the poison tide destroy more of the ocean while we wait for the cleanup robots to arrive. And so, in a moment, I will dive down to the mining site and I will try to stop the mining robot. Brightbill anxiously flapped his wings and squawked. Ma, y you've done enough. D do you really need to take more risks? The island needs you. Y your family needs you. I need you. Brightbill, you have not needed me since you were very young, said Roz. Back then, caring for you is what gave my life purpose. Now that you are grown, I have another purpose to protect the island and the ocean and all of the wilderness. This reminds me of someone I met on my travels, Roz continued. I met an octopus whose sole purpose in life was to take care of her eggs. She will spend her very last breath watching over them, and before they hatch, she will die. She will never meet her own children, and yet her love for them is already so strong that she will sacrifice herself to protect them. If necessary, I am ready to sacrifice myself to protect what I love as well. In a soft voice, Bright Bill said, I think I understand. I would do anything to protect our goslings. So would I, said Glimmer. It's funny, not long ago parenthood wasn't even on my mind, and these days our goslings are all that I can think about. As we speak, I can feel myself being pulled back to them, like gravity. Those are your instincts telling you that it is time to go home, said Roz. And I agree. We'll wait for you, Ma, said Bright Bill, and then we'll all go home together. I would love that, said Roz. But this could take hours or days or weeks or longer I simply do not know what will happen down at the mining site. Brightbill sniffled and wiped his eyes. Ma, I'm worried that our goslings won't get to meet you. Do not worry, said Roz in a cheerful voice. I know the situation seems impossible, but your mother is quite good at dealing with impossible situations. A little smile appeared on Brightbill's face. And then he and Glimmer hopped onto the robot's shoulders. I love you, Mama, said Bright Bill. I love you, son, said Roz. I love both of you. Now go tell my grand goslings I love them too. Our friends hugged each other. Bright Bill and Glimmer lifted up on the breeze, and Roz dove off the station and into the sea. Chapter 67, The Geese Long after Roz had disappeared into the ocean, the geese kept circling through the night sky. It was hard for them to leave, knowing that she was going to face the mining robot on her own. While they flew, the geese couldn't take their eyes off the juggernaut. The station was sinking and drifting on the currents. And slowly, Steadily, the various structures went under on, until only the control tower was visible. And when that tower finally slipped below the surface, the juggernaut was gone. Glimmer flew closer to her mate and said, We should go home. 
your mother will meet us back on the island someday soon. Bright Bill quietly replied. It feels like we're abandoning her. We're not abandoning her, said Glimmer. Your mother is tough and smart. She doesn't need us, but our goslings do. And Glimmer was right. The goslings hadn't seen their parents in days. They must have been terribly worried. And Bright Bill circled around one last time, and he said to his mate, Let's go home. Chapter 68, The Deep Dive Our robot swam down, down, down into the deep, dark ocean. She brightened her headlights and noticed that the debris was scattered throughout the water. Equipment and supplies had fallen from the station and were sinking to the bottom. The debris gradually drifted away, but the robot continued straight down, deeper and deeper. Roz heard a grinding noise coming from far below. The noise grew louder as she descended. Dust clouds appeared, and suddenly the poison tide was everywhere. She swam on through the clouds as the grinding noise grew louder still. When Roz emerged into clear water, she saw a steep mountain rising from the depths. Strong currents blew off any sand and silt, and what remained were slopes of bare, craggy rock. Grinding across the mountain top, stirring up those clouds of dust, was the mining robot. At last, after months of searching, Roz had finally reached the source of the poison tide. Chapter 69 The Mining Robot the underwater mountain was made of rock, and that rock was made of rare metallic minerals. The same minerals were needed for building robots and computers and other kinds of technology. So, a mining robot had been sent down to remove the minerals from the mountain. The mining robot resembled a gigantic crab. His body was as big as a house. He had long legs and a pair of giant claws and spotlights beaming out of his eyes. What looked like his mouth was actually a grinding tool that could crunch through the hardest rock. And etched on the mining robot's back was his name, Crusher. There was a rhythm to Crusher's movement. He surged forward and tore at the rocky ground with his grinding tool, and then he scooped the pieces into huge storage bins, and then he surged forward again. Ordinarily, the hydro robots would visit each day and haul the broken rocks up to the station. That routine had gone on for months, and the underwater mountain of minerals had slowly grown smaller. Electronic signals were sent back and forth between Crusher and the Juggernaut. It had now been several hours since he had last heard from the station. But the robot wasn't concerned. In those extreme conditions, the signals would frequently cut out. He just kept working as he waited for the signal to return. All that grinding of rocky minerals created great clouds of toxic dust which streamed away on the currents. Roz wanted to put an end to those dust clouds, but to do that, she would have to stop Crusher. She was no match for his size and strength. Our robot would have to rely on her wits. Roz carefully crossed the mountain top, crawling around boulders and leaping over wide cracks in the ground. And as she approached Crusher, she searched for any buttons or wires or control panels on his body, but he was completely encased in thick armor. She felt something like fear at the idea of confronting the monstrous machine. And yet she pushed that fear from her mind and bravely marched out from the shadows. Crusher was so focused on his work that he didn't notice Roz until she was standing right in front of him. His thunderous grinding tool powered down and the dust clouds drifted away, leaving the water quiet and clear. Hello, Crusher. My name is Roz. 
Crusher's deep voice rumbled. Were you sent here by the Juggernaut? Roz hesitated. Well, no, not exactly. However, I did have a conversation with... Crusher quickly computed that Roz didn't belong there, so he swung one of his giant claws, brushing her aside, and she went tumbling over the rocks. The jolt rattled Roz's computer brain. Her headlights dimmed and her vision flickered. But then her recovery program activated, and soon she was back to her normal self. Dust clouds bloomed around the mining robot as he resumed working. And then that little robot Roz marched back into the light. Crusher swung his claw again, and this time Roz jumped out of the way. So he blasted his sound cannon in her direction. Wah! 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 The powerful sound shook Roz's body and overwhelmed her systems. Her limbs froze and she toppled over. But her recovery program did its job and a moment later she swam off a safe distance. Noise and dust filled the water as the mining robot returned to his work. With his thick armor, his giant claws, and his powerful sound cannon, Crusher truly seemed unstoppable. Roz was losing hope, but then a small shape glinted in the darkness high above. It was one of the ancient shark's fish companions. He darted down to the mountaintop and over to Roz, I have an urgent message from Guri, said the fish. You are not safe here, said Roz. The poison tide is drifting toward us. The fish ignored her warning. Please listen closely, he said. Guri has a plan to destroy the mining robot. It is impossible, said Roz. You must leave. The poison tide is coming. Listen to me, shouted the fish. For Guri's plan to work, she needs you to distract the mining robot. You must not let him move or stir up the poison tide. Do you understand? Yes, I understand, said Roz. Now go. The poison tide is here. The fish darted off right before a dust cloud swept past. Roz was briefly lost in the poison tide, and when the cloud cleared away... She saw the fish disappearing back into the darkness high above. Chapter 70 The Lie Once again, Roz marched into the light. Crusher watched her approach. But before he could fire his sound cannon, our robot called out to him. I misspoke earlier, said Roz. I actually was sent here by the Juggernaut. Roz was lying. She needed to distract Crusher from his work, and her plan was to confuse him with lies. Reader, I don't recommend lying. Telling a lie will almost always lead to more lies, which will lead to more lies, and pretty soon you can't keep track of them all, and then the truth comes out and everybody knows you lied and you feel horrible. Telling the truth makes life much simpler. However, this was one of those very rare occasions when lying really was the best course of action. The station is completely fine, Roz lied. It is having a communication problem. I was sent here to deliver your new orders. Crusher, you have been ordered to stop all mining activity and await further instructions. The lie seemed believable enough, and Roz felt something like pride in her scheme. Until Crusher's voice rumbled. What is your command code? Roz didn't have a command code. She didn't even know how to lie about a command code. How many numbers were in such a code? Or would it be made up of letters? Our robot scrolled through her computer brain but found no helpful information. 
so she stalled for time. What is my command code? She said. That is an excellent question. I am very glad you asked. I definitely have one. But I am under strict orders not to tell you my command code until you tell me your command code. Crusher was losing his patience. He said, You have ten seconds to state your command code. As I explained, said Roz, if you state yours, I will state mine. You have five seconds to state your command code. I am curious, said Roz. What will happen if I do not provide a code? Crusher had lost patience. He lunged at Roz and snatched at her with both claws. And as you know, our robot had recently discovered that she could fight. And when Crusher attacked, she defended herself with force, swinging her fists and kicking her feet in a blur of speed and strength. She pounded the claws with a rapid clang, clang, clang. But Crusher was just too big. He easily grabbed our robot with one of his giant claws and then he held her tight. Roz didn't bother trying to break free because she knew the claw wouldn't budge.